Uh, let's have a quick word of prayer and then we'll go ahead and get started on, on tonight. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. You're gracious in so many ways to us. And as we remember that it's uh, after your son, there's nothing else we need to look forward to. We, we have all that we need in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that. Everything else is just is just gift after gift after gift from you, Father. And we thank you for how you show that each and every day, how you love your children, but how we should continue to use what you give us to reveal you to the world so that those who don't know you would come to know you and live their lives according to the plan that you have and that we would bring glory to your name. Father, speak through your word tonight so that we would know more and more about the character that you want to reveal to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so we finished up Philippians uh, last week. If, uh, for those that weren't here, we did finish that up. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and just move on into Colossians uh, tonight. So we'll stay with Paul and we'll, we'll just, we got a few more weeks. And so we'll see what we can get done uh, through that in the time we have before we break for summer. So uh, Colossae was a town in Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. And so if you're wondering, remember Philippi was in Greece, so now we've moved into Asia Minor, and it was located about 100 miles from Ephesus, and so there was kind of a, a, a three-city um, location there, and, and Colossae was one of those. By the time of Paul, it was a, it was a city in decline. Um, it had been an extremely old city, at one time was prosperous, but kind of like here, where it, when the interstates came through, a lot of the smaller towns in Alabama kind of got missed, and that's really what happened with Colossae when the Romans came through. A lot of the trade started moving away from there and went through other towns like Ephesus, and it started to move into decline, but it was a very old city uh, with datings back to, to 485 B.C. during the reign of Xerxes. So it had been around for a long time. Now Paul did not found this church, so it was not one of the churches that he founded, but he was very well acquainted with the believers there, and so uh, hence this letter that he's written to them. It was most likely started by Epaphras, uh, and he was either serving Paul in prison, or he was also imprisoned with him, and so Epaphras was probably who gave Paul most of the information about this church and so that would probably give it a founding date of around 50 AD which would be roughly 10 years before the dating of this letter which is uh, uh, normally thought to be around 61 or 60 AD and that's based on Luke's account in Acts 19, 9, and 10 where he talks about the school of Tyrannus and how Paul was educating people in Ephesus and then how they all went out throughout all of Asia, and that's how the word became known. So it was more than likely one of the people that was in that time period of a couple of years with Paul that went on to found this, most likely, as we say, Epaphras. So uh, the primary issue addressed in this letter is, is false teaching from within the church. And so the context of that is what we're going to see kind of broken out by Paul. And the main section of that will be starting in, in chapter 2, verse 8, going through 3, 4, where Paul is dealing with that issue. So when we've talked in some of his letters about false teachers, but in this it's actually false teaching from within the body, not from outside. Um, so we, this letter was most likely written around the same time as Ephesians and Philemon, and probably delivered on that same journey by Tychicus when he delivered those other, other letters when he was traveling. And what we'll see as we go through, it's kind of broken into two sections. The first section dealing with uh, theological ins instruction from Paul, and the second with ethical instruction. But overall, the theme is going to be the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ alone in our salvation and sanctification, that He is the only one we need to be looking to, that man can't add anything to what Christ has done in His salvic work. So that's, that's kind of a brief summary of what we're going to be uh, going through into Colossians. And so it starts out here in the opening, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to all the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace and peace from God our Father. And so 
Paul has not met these believers personally, as we've talked about. So he actually opens this pointing out his position as an apostle of Christ, an eyewitness to the resurrection. So he's, he's, he's stating from the beginning his authority that he has to be able to, to write this letter. But it's not, a, it's not a boastful authority. It's actually done in humility as you see how he writes that because he expresses that this authority as an apostle is not from any power of skill that he possesses, but it's from God's grace alone that he holds this position only due to the initiative of God using him as an instrument, which he's grateful for. And saints, again, it's a frequent term in Paul's letters, and it always refers to physical believers. So that's, that's y'all. It's not supernatural beings that he's addressing. He, that's his favorite term to address the believers that are in Christ, are the saints. And so he'll, he uses that throughout all of his letters. And then he, he opens up after that greeting with this prayer of thanks. And so we see in verse 3, he says, So we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit." So this is, is in, in my Bible, as in the Greek, this is one long, uninterrupted sentence that Paul has, has written. Um, some, some versions will have different breaks in there, but in the Greek it was just this one long sentence. Bless you, by the way. Um, and so uh, we see Paul focusing on that, and he notes the presence of faith and love in these believers as evidence of the Christian character of the entire church is what he's starting off here. And so what he's saying here is that their faith is one that's practiced and, and, and leveled out, that Christ is certainly the object of their love, but, but they had extended it to every aspect of their life. Um, and so he, he's really commending them that how their care, Christian character continues to get be on display. And then secondly, that their love was sacrificial. Agape is the word that we use, and he does as well, which means they're concerned more with others than they are themselves, and it's also indiscriminate, which is a great example for us today and what we see going on in the world because it was not based on any worldly partitions or divisions that they would see. Their love crossed all human barriers that were in their their culture at that time. And he says as that was exactly demonstrated by Christ and His love. He had no, no divisions of people according to man's views. And so here he says their hope was a present reality in their life. And so my, the definition I use there, what, what is hope? It's a life-changing certainty that hasn't happened yet. It's not a wish that we want. It is something that we hold as certain, but it just hasn't happened yet. And he says that was a present reality in their, their life, that they lived a hope of something they knew was certain that was yet to come. And that this assured hope came from the proclamation of the gospel. This word of truth, as Paul called it, was sufficient and no further addition to it from man was going to be needed. And that's how they lived their life out. And then he gives kind of three statements from in 6 through 8 there in that verse that trace the movement of the gospel from God to the Colossians through Epaphras. And it says, first, the general nature of the gospel's advance is given. And what he says is it continues to spread and bear fruit. It accomplishes the work that God had intended from the beginning because of them. Second, it came to Colossae as evidence of God's grace in his revealing his truth. And so to Paul, grace was found in the introduction of the gospel, which was the person and work of Jesus Christ, but as well as the basis element. 
which was the redemption from sin and being brought into this right relationship of God. So there was a, a twofold uh, element to what Paul was expressing in this grace that he expanded upon. And then third, that God advances his gospel by calling persons to communicate this message of grace. That he calls us not just to receive grace, but to communicate that grace that's been in us. And that was evidenced through Epaphras. Epaphras received the gospel when he was in Ephesus, but he also has now communicated this gospel to the church in Colossae and their lives have been uh, riched, uh, enriched through that. And so, yeah. Right. A doulos who was a diakonah. Uh, yeah, a bond servant who was a faithful servant of Christ. Both. Thank you for that. But yeah, both, because he was. He's not just a servant, he's, also, he's not a bond servant, he's also a servant of Christ through that deacon. To get our word deacon from. And so that's, as we, you've said and, and Eric many times, deacons are to be servants before all things. When you take that position, it's a position to serve as Christ ordered to us. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, so what he said, and this, so he finishes that up with that. So that's a great, great point that Jerry means because that's, as he finishes that up, he starts in nine, for this reason. So when he's saying that, he's pointing back to what he's just talked about in verse 9. He says, so for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So he's saying, pointing back to that, and he says, because of these things and because of this service attitude, it identifies the spiritual condition of the church. And we should all be so fortunate that people would look at us in that same light, that we have a servant's heart, a spiritual condition that is, is only concerned with others. And so because of this, Paul specifically is praying now that they would grow in the knowledge of God's will. And so not just growing in knowledge, like we want to grow in knowledge of Scripture, but knowledge of God's will. What, does, what is it God wants to happen? Not just our, His will for our life, but what is His will for all things. And so this knowledge of God could only come through God's own revelation of Himself to those who seek to know Him. And so to Paul, it was actually unthinkable that somebody could learn about God. That you could go like we would think and go to the library or go to Google and actually learn something about God. Now, you can certainly learn th truths about God. We do that through Scripture. And we learn that through other people's uh, experience with, in their lives with God. Is that so? But divine truth is Paul, what Paul is trying to say. Divine truth can only be revealed by the Spirit. God can only reveal who He is himself to each of us through his spirit you can't go somewhere outside of God to learn that and that's what he's saying I want you to grow in that knowledge knowledge of his will because you're seeking it and so he gives then through this the characteristics of those who are in God's will so first is is this continued growth in spiritual life and that would be shown as he as he talks about them in service and an increased knowledge of who God is. The character of God continues to be revealed in you through this growth and service in your spiritual life. Second, it's the power to persevere. And this is needed power to endure the circumstances of life and to be able to react to that positively. Not just to hold up, but to actually have a positive uh, reaction to it. And so that's where he says here, starting in in verse 10, it says, So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously. He adds that word to that. And so he uses two words there. In mine it says steadfast. In some it will say endurance. But he's saying, so 
he's using two words. And he's, so endurance is this capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances. So you need that. You have to be able to keep moving when things are difficult. And patience is a state of emotional calm in the face of misfortune without complaining. That's really the key there. <laughs> that it's not that we can just have emotional calm in, the, in this face of misfortune or adversity, but we can do it without complaining. And that's what Paul is trying to, to draw out there in the, by, by putting those two words together, steadfast and patience, joyously. That in both of those circumstances, we actually have a positive and joyous outlook when those things of life come at us. And so that's a, another characteristic of if you're living in God's will. And then third is that joyful thanksgiving. Realizing that salvation was initiated by God and accomplished through His Son, and that allows them to express this eternal, joyous thanks. It's, it's, it's like being a goose, as my friend used to say, you wake up in a new world every day. You know, everything is gone. And Paul is saying, we should wake up every day with this realization of what has been done for us through Christ. And that we have this eternal outlook. And so circumstances in that case don't matter. We should wake up joyous and thankful and live in gratitude. And that's what Paul is trying to express. And he's actually saying that's what you do to them. He's not calling them to do that. He's actually saying this is what you do and that's why I'm so thankful for who you are because you actually live this out. You have an eternal joy about you and that's a characteristic of living inside of God's will. And then he kind of adds this Old Testament language in here where he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So that's actually an Old Testament phrase that links back to the Exodus. It's the same language used when they were coming into the promised land about the promised inheritance that they were going to get. And he links that into these believers about the inheritance that we already have been promised and given by God into His new kingdom. And so he's linking the old with the new here and these new believers. Paul is always talking about the Exodus. And he sees us and them in this new Exodus. We're in this new movement of, of moving through the wilderness to the new promised land at the second coming of Christ. And so there's always going to be this comparison with him to the old Exodus with the new, which we are actually in now. We're moving to this new promised land that we're going to get when Christ returns and we should see ourselves that way that we're bringing this great word that's coming. So he says that's it. And then his final statement is about God's redemption and that he rescues believers. And so we see that in 14 here, in 13 and 14, because he says here, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so, he, he's, this is actually warfare terminology that he is using here. He's using terminology of being at war. And he's drawing us into it, and he's talking about the great redemptive power of God in that, in how he has this great power to rescue believers who are in battle. And so, He's emphasized that by the use of these words, rescue, dominion, and kingdom. And here he's contrasting two things, the dominion of darkness, or this kingdom of darkness, with the kingdom of the Son. It's the kingdom of Christ. And so what he's trying to point out is our spiritual condition before Christ has placed us in this kingdom of darkness. This was our home. This is where we were. This is not something that we move into. It's actually the place we start. And we are in this kingdom of darkness. And he's reminding them that's where you were. As similar to what he had in, in Ephesians chapter 2, the reminder of them being dead, as he said in Ephesians 2.1. You were dead. Here he's telling them, this was your home. This was, 
your kingdom. You were in the dominion and the kingdom of darkness. That's where you were before Christ. But God has changed us. He's actually changed us. Not just moved us. First, He changes us through Christ. He makes us new, a new being. He brings life into us. And after we're changed, then He moves us into another kingdom. He, you know, as I like to say, He gives you another passport. You had one that showed you were a citizen here. Now you're changed and you get a new passport. You get a new declaration of citizenship and you are now in the kingdom of the Son. You've actually been moved from one place to another and that's what Paul is trying to point out. Through this battle, this cosmic battle that's going on, God has the power to actually move people from one place to another and into the kingdom of His Son. Now, he makes the use in his letters of two righteous kingdoms that he'll talk about in all of his letters, and they're not equivalent. And so I just want to point that out here because of what he's talking about. Here he's talking about the kingdom of Christ. And he'll also, in his other letters, he'll talk about the kingdom of God. And these are not the same thing that he's talking about. To him, the kingdom of God is that heavenly ultimate kingdom that we will we will find ourselves in. It's that place we're going to be at the end when all things are made new. That is God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of Christ is where we are now. That's where believers are part until the second coming when the Son is going to turn that over to the Father. All right, so where does that come from? In 1 Corinthians 15, 24 is where Paul kind of makes that Comparison. So I'll just read it for you real quick what he's talking about there. Uh, he says this. He says, he's talking about Christian hope and starting in verse 24, he says, And then comes the end when He delivers up the kingdom, He being Christ, to God, the, to God and Father, when He has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for He must reign until He has put all enemies under His feet. And so he's talking about we're in this kingdom of the Son and then when he, he establishes all things, all things are made new at His second coming, then He takes that wonderful earthly kingdom of His where His believers are and He transfers that to the Father, to the final ultimate kingdom that we will be a part of. And so that's Paul's talking. It's, to us, it seems like the same thing, but Paul's talking about this kind of transitional move that we get in Christ. And so, what he's trying to say here is that to be in God's kingdom, which we actually are, you have to first be placed into the kingdom of Christ who brings the believer to the Father. He presents His church, His bride, to the Father when all things are made new. And that's kind of the picture Paul is trying to present here in this. That you're already part of it, but, you, you, but this, as we would hope people would say, this is not the ultimate. <laughs> we are in Christ, and we have the ultimate in salvation, but this is not the best that it's ever going to be. And for us to think that's the, that anything that we could have here would be the best that we can have would be wrong thinking. We talked about that a little bit in Philippians, about us having a prospective eschatology, that we look for something greater. So Paul is saying, yeah, you're in a great kingdom. We belong into the kingdom of Christ, but that is part of God's kingdom, but ultimately it's going to be given to the Father. And that will be the ultimate when we reign with all parts of the Trinity together at the same time in their presence. And that's what we look forward to. That's that certainty of hope. So we're almost out of time. So the next section that we're going to get into... Uh, will deal with who more of who Christ is through this. And so we don't have enough time to get into that. So we'll go ahead and stop it here and we'll get into starting in verse 15 next time that we meet, if that's okay with Miss Susan, who's looking and nodding her head at me. I love her approval. It's the best approval in the world. So, uh, so let me close this in prayer and then we'll let y'all get to choir. Father, we just so thank you for, our, for your word. How... Something written so long ago can speak such great truth into our life. We do thank You for uh, 
the wonderful picture of this church in Colossae and how Paul is hearing about them and how his praise for who they are trying to be in Christ, living in the will of God each and every day, displaying that to others, and especially, Lord, without impartiality. In this time, can we have that the same? That the divisions that men try to make are divisions that do nothing but separate people from each other and from You. That we would have an indiscriminate love for others, Lord, so that we can share the love that You demonstrated going all the way to the cross for those who hated You, who called You things that, that You were not, who, who treated You unjustly yet, you still love them through that. Lord, can we have that same love that is demonstrated by these wonderful believers who I look forward to meeting one day when all things are made new and we are in that final eternal kingdom that you will establish. How we praise you, Father, for the hope that is certain that we look forward to in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you all.